Welcome to the Impactful Leadership Show. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. John Lennon once said, a dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is reality. Join me as we connect dreams to reality by chatting with innovators from around Washington, DC. Our show is proudly sponsored by the DC chapter of the Entrepreneurs Organization. This is the Impactful Leadership Show. Well, welcome to the Impactful Leadership Show. I'm your host, Greg McDonough, CEO of Blackburn Capital Advisors. Today's guest is a passionate entrepreneur, speaker, facilitator, and father. And I'd also say a good, good friend of mine. In fact, the last time I saw this guest, we were on a road trip coming back from a conference. And uh, we stopped by Fuddruckers to get a hamburger and some wedge fries. And something I've craved ever since I was a kid. And if any of you out there listening are in my age group and craving Fuddruckers, do not go. It is not the same experience <laughs> as I had as a child. But our guest uh, is a past chapter president of the Entrepreneurs Organization. His entrepreneurial journey began at eight years old with his family business. He's the founder and facilitator for The Painted Picture, CEO and founder of Omnia. Please welcome Dan Leonello. Welcome, Dan. Thanks very much, Greg. Appreciate the invite. And Absolutely. you know, you, you did upsell that FUD is pretty darn good. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> I, I owe you another one for sure. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> well, as you know, Dan, our podcast is about leadership. And my favorite question to ask my guests is, tell me about some misconceptions in leadership. Yeah, um, there's a couple that come to mind, Greg. Uh, the first, you know, it's this idea that if it's to be, it's up to me. Uh, it's kind of the superhero complex. Uh, another would be the fact that, um, you know, virtually all of us, when we first start our businesses, we're accidental entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We don't know it all. As a matter of fact, we barely know anything at that point in time. And so, you know, the imposter syndrome kicks in because of that. And it's interesting becoming mindful of how we can manage it over time. Uh, and the last um, is really the three roles of an entrepreneur. Most don't understand when it starts that the three rules are being an employee, you know, a leader and visionary, but also an owner. And you have to literally put on all three different hats in order to navigate your way through the waters that you're pointing your boat down. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And, and they're different hats at different times. And sometimes it's a mixture of yes. those hats. Uh, sometimes so they're conflicting. Yeah, certainly. Yes. So let's take take those misconceptions in reverse order and dig in yep. a little bit deeper into that one where, you know, as, as you just mentioned, we've got three different hats. We've got the employee, we got the leader, and we got an owner. Mm -hmm. Dig in a little bit deeper between the differences of those three and how they conflict at times. Well, it's interesting. I mean, the employee is the one that's doing the work. Uh, whatever that work or job description might be as you've chosen it at the beginning or as time goes on. Um, and interestingly enough, giving yourself permission to change your job description in order to fit where it is you want to go versus where you've been. Um, I, I often tell the story of one of my customers a few years ago, they had about 250 employees and there were three founders. Um, also all three were owners and all three were part of the leadership, but one of the three did not like the stress and the feeling of being in that role of leadership. He just didn't, it didn't sit with him well. So he actually chose to become a, a draftsman within the organization. So his salary for being an employee was based on what you would normally pay a draftsman. While the other two founders, their salary was based on the fact that one was CEO and one was COO of the company, um, which were completely different numbers, but they, they were all okay with it because it served him personally. Um, and of course, all three were owners, so they each had equal responsibility at the ownership level, making decisions at the high, high level for cash, legal issues. Um, however, the third person did not get involved at all in vision, strategy, management of employees or any of those things. So it was a clear definer of, of the difference between those roles. So, you know, as an employee, you got to do, you got to perform, you got to create value in that level. Um, when you're a leader, visionary manager, it's learning to delegate. Um, and one of the biggest things is learning to take time to let your mind clear mm. and allow yourself to, to do the learning, the reading, uh, the thinking uh, to determine strategy and vision for your company. And lastly, as an owner, uh, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon you 
to create the highest value you can for the shareholders, <laughs> which is you. So now we have to make decisions at that level in terms of, um, uh, you know, in terms of making, you know, making decisions that will, as an owner, make the value of the asset and think of it as an asset grow, uh, grow, assuming that's what you want the asset to do. Um, but a lot of people in entrepreneurship will um, kind of buy themselves a job. So you might get um, a little higher annual salary. Um, you will you will potentially have potentially have better uh, control of your schedule and and how you use your time. Um, but if you are if you're st if you're in the business and having to perform in order for it to um, generate revenue uh, at a at an operational or a hands on level, it will reduce your your ability to increase the value of the asset uh, in that role. That, that's very well said. You know, thinking about the story you shared amongst the three founders, um, I suspect they didn't jump into those roles or understanding those lines initially when they founded that business. Uh, were you part of that journey or, or watched that journey as they all came together to start it? And then they realized that, hey, I'm better over here and you're better over there. Because that's very rare, I find, in our community, especially amongst founders, that somebody says, you know what? I want to be a draftsman. And thank you very much. You know, it was interesting because the, you know, when when they started the business, they didn't have any idea that this was going to be an issue. Right. And so as as it grew and they grew, um, the one person was, and, and, and this is something I, I talk about a lot is awareness, you know, being aware of what's going on in your body of how you're thinking and and excuse me, what you're thinking and how you're feeling. And if you can become aware enough and then understand that there's misalignment and then put the ego aside and have conversations, true, heartfelt, safe, deep conversations about how you feel with the others. And it's just essentially what happened was rather than creating conflict and having them implode in one way or another, they were able to have conversations that were deep enough to understand what was going on. And, you know, you, the, the person's ego would have been pushed right aside because he was able to say, you know what, I would rather live a life that I enjoy and I understand the math. And, and this is where, you know, thinking from an abundance standpoint versus scarcity um, and, and understanding that the best thing for the company is for me to step back from a leadership role and that it's going to do me, serve me much, much better as an owner in the long run. Certainly. Certainly. Um, so going, jumping up one to your second misconception, mm -hmm. when you talked about the accidental entrepreneur, we think we, we know it all at the beginning. Um, walk us through some illustrations of that and how it develops over time. Okay. Um, well, typically entrepreneurs are technicians when they start out, they have a skill set, um, and they, they don't know that they've accidentally become a salesperson because they had to go and sell someone to get that first job, whatever that job was. And so they, they convinced somebody to separate themselves with, from some cash in order for you to do something for them. And so step one is the technician where you're doing something, typically. Um, and then the next stage is you've got to then, if you're, if you're expanding and, and creating more demand, uh, learning to bring people in, um, you know, which is hiring. Um, and, and you might bring in two or three or four. And it's interesting because the, the ability to delegate and the understanding of leadership at that level, um, is a challenge is, is the next challenge, new challenge, the new learning that has to happen. Um, and then it, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, uh, you know, I've got a good friend who got to 11 employees and discovered that he did a bad job of hiring, hiring because he didn't understand values and culture and 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 work ethic and he literally fired his whole team at 11 went to zero and started over again you know who he is you didn't like okay um and so the learning curve is more like a learning cliff when you start this journey of entrepreneurship it's like going to yosemite and looking straight up that thing and knowing that 
Um, you know, you, you, you get to climb the first section, you learn how to do that, but it's going to take you time. You're going to make mistakes and you're going to have to do it over and over again. And then once you get that, it's easy to climb that first piece. And then we get to start now working on the next section and the next and the next. And so entrepreneurship is a series of learning curves, um, which means it's a series of putting ourselves into a zone of discomfort and needing to learn to become comfortable in that zone of discomfort because we're constantly challenging ourselves or we come to a certain plateau that we choose we don't want to push ourselves through for a period of time or ever, depending on on who we are. Um, that starts to look at the uh, sort of your risk profile, uh, the kind of person you are, where you're at in life, do you have family and 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 that type of thing and and where do you want to take it? So some people will put a put the journey on pause and stay at a certain level while they're at a certain point in their lives and then and then change that as time goes on. You know, you reminded me, I was sitting in a leadership academy last week or the week before, probably the week before, and there was a woman presenting who led an all-female team to summer at Everest. Yeah. And part of her story, to your point, is when you're at base camp and you're going to camp one, you do that trek two or three, maybe four times just to get used to that journey. And then eventually you go and you pass one and you go to two, but then you still come back to base camp. So there's this constant oscillation of learning and performing that is very similar to the phases that you just talked through. It's, right? it's the same. Uh, I remember another uh, gentleman who, who uh, summited Ep Everest, but not till their third try. So they went through all of the things you described including getting within a hundred feet of the top and then having to turn around, you know, bef before finally making it and learning as they went. So one of the things that's interesting is a big shift for us is when we can become intentional in our learning. In other words, look ahead, ask yourself, what do I need to know next year, next quarter, next month, and start the learning process now instead of having to do you know an even more accelerated learning at the time and what that is is looking upstream you know looking into the future um asking yourself what does the future look like at, at whatever point um and then what's my role in that and if i don't know guess what especially in eo there is always someone who has been there many many of us have been places and so Asking the question inside your chapter, you know, who do you know that's gone to this level before? I'd like to talk to them. Um, I was talking to someone else a couple of weeks ago um, who, who wanted to do Coachella. And it was really interesting because um, they had decided they wanted to do it kind of six years from now as they were looking at their painted picture going forward. And, and so, you know, then we got to the concept of collapsing time, which is once you know where you want to go um, and you start paying attention and learning in that direction, oftentimes you can make things happen sooner than you expected simply because you're focused on it and you're willing to receive information that can help. And so I said, let's reverse engineer going to Coachella, like singing at Coachella. All right. And, and it was interesting because the question I first question I asked is, has anyone ever done it? The answer is yes. Anyone ever done it in less than six years? Yeah, three, 18 months, depending on who they are. Do you know anyone who has done it in that three year span? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. Guess what? You have a mentor, you have someone to learn from who can share their experience, what they did. It may or may not align with where you go and what you do, but the best thing is you learn from it. And the things that you learn will help you help to guide you on the journey, help to accelerate the process, and ideally help you to, you know, not spend some of the tuition they spent. You get to spend it on something else that someone that that no one has tried yet. <laughs> you know? Dan, that's super powerful. Um, and I'd love for you to share another story of that. What really jumped off the page for me was when you said intentional learning, right? Mm -hmm. So you're looking out three years of what you want to be doing. And what do you need to be learning a year from now, 18 months from now, tomorrow? Yes. Um, and we'll get into the painted picture because I'd like you to explain that in great detail for our audience. But before okay. that, um, 
walk us through another example of this intentional learning because it, it's a component of the larger pa painted picture. Yes. But it really struck a bell with me. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more. Well, you know, Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind, you know, um, and it, the, the painted picture process is that picture of actually looking at the future, whatever it might be. It could be a project that's three months long, um, or it could be something in your personal life. It could be in the business. Um, and, you, you know, one of the things that's interesting is, uh, and I think, you know, I, I talked about the imposter syndrome, which is um, not believing, some a person not believing that they almost have the right to be doing what they're doing because they're not smart enough or good enough. Um, and what's really interesting is there's always a backstory around that. And so if we determine where we want to go, then and we, we don't have to worry about how we're going to get there at that moment. Um, but by painting that picture, it then becomes a filter for decisions that we're making going forward. Mm. And by reverse engineering that future, we can go all the way back to today and say, okay, what do I need to do today in order to create that future? Uh, each and, and literally intentionally each day, and this is this is something that's so important, um, is at the end of each day asking yourself, you know, what did I do today? What worked? What didn't work? What did I learn? And based on those results, what am I going to do tomorrow? Mm. So you can do that for a day, a week, a month, a quarter, a year. And actually taking the time. So, you know, it, it, um, I'll, I'll never forget. There was one conversation I had with someone, uh, yeah, another EO or in a, in, and, um, he said, you know, I go on holidays and I come back and 80% of what I did when I was in the bill in the, in the office got done. And the other thing, actually I'll go back a step. His complaint was he couldn't start working on strategy until Friday at five o'clock. Okay. So that meant he was working all weekend on strategy instead of spending time with his kids. That was where this started. And then I asked the question about the vacation, et cetera. And what happened was I said, well, when you come back, you know, does that 80% still get done? Yes. Who does it get done by? Me. And the question I asked was, well, let's pretend you only did 60% instead of the 80. That would mean you could start working on strategy on Thursday at five instead of Friday at five. And it's, it's actually, you know, taking a look at how we're spending our time and becoming intentional to think and mm -hmm. to learn. And, um, you know, as we, there's, boy, there's, there's, there's such a lot to unpack, right? Because, you know, when, when we, when we look into the future and paint a picture, we then start programming something called a reticular activator, which is a little filter that lets things into our brain and it gets programmed by how we think. And what we feel. And so by programming it with what we want in the future, we start to then be able to, to recognize um, information and opportunities that we might not have before, and we allow them in. So all of those have to do with the intentionality. Um, and another piece, you know, really is what role do I have to play and or do I want to play? Um, and a lot of times I find um we don't give ourselves permission because of guilt or other things to actually think that we can do these things in the future and then start executing to make it happen. That's, that's fantastic. It's, you're, you're <laughs> driving right into my heart at the moment, which is one of your, your superpowers. You. Um, you know, one of the things I love that you said was talking about the end of your day routine. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, folks out there, the books, right? The middle miracle morning, Warren's 10, 10, 10, you need, no. and they all describe sort of what you should do when you first wake up in the morning, mm -hmm. but not many people talk about how you should close your day. In fact, I think the closing of your day, and I don't practice this yet, but the closing of your day and the opening of your following day, that's your cycle. It's really yeah. not about what you're doing while you're awake, sitting behind your computer, dealing with people recording podcasts. It's truly like, what was the intention of the day? Did I achieve it? Could I have done better, et cetera, et cetera, in the evening, rest, recover, and then as you wake up, sort of re-engage in that same intention. One of the things that's interesting, too, is part of the rest recover is that your subconscious is solving the issues while you're sleeping. <laughs> and you'll literally either wake up in the middle of the night or when you wake up in the morning with clarity. 
I literally had someone the other day send me, I don't know how long the text was because they happened to have been thinking about an issue that, that, that we were talking about and they cut up in the middle of the night to go to the washroom and it just went bang. It landed on the, on the top of their brain and they just sat there and pushed the whole thing out so that it was written down and it was now clear and done. Um, it just makes such a difference. But that happens because our brains don't stop working. They act, our brain stops working when we work too hard instead of the opposite. If we tire it out and, you know, create so much heat inside that all the neurons kind of melt together, nothing works, <laughs> right? And it's really interesting what can happen if you, if you, if you go for a walk or a ride, uh, you know, or, or a run and set an intention at the beginning of the run and how often do you run, Greg? Yeah, a couple of times a week. Right. Okay. And if you think about it and then just start. And when as soon as your brain stops working, that's when the answers just appear. Mm -hmm. And they, it's it's like they fall and they land on your brain and it's like, oh, okay, make a note, carry on. Um, but the key there is the harder you try to think it, the less likely it is that you're going to um, come up with something because you're, you're actually tightening it up and it's just, it doesn't work. Okay. Right. right. And golf, they'll say, um, you know, swing softly and enjoy the extra distance. Right? You're not, <laughs> exactly. You're not all pent up. You're not yeah. like doing 15 different bad maneuvers to try to execute on what you're trying to execute. Yes. Um, I love that. I wrote down sleep more and work less. Uh, that's fantastic. So Dan, Let's talk about your discovery of the painted picture process. And then after that, we'll get into your background and how you can, how you got to where you are and, and your journey. Uh -huh. um, you know, I've been through your facilitation now, I think three different times, including a one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is amazing. And, and it's still in the top of my drawer. And I, re I look to it periodically. I, I wish it was a daily habit, but we'll get there, you know. We went from annual to quarterly, so that's progress. <laughs> but but talk to us just about- Just doing it is progress, right? It, and yes, and right. whatever's working for you, that's that's the key. Sorry, go ahead. No, so I was going to ask you to sort of explain your discovery of this painted picture process and how you help others with it. Well, I um, I was part of a forum, still am, but uh, you know, Brian Scudamore from Got Junk, uh, Cameron Harold were in the forum, uh, and-, and uh, by happenstance, there was another uh, German Swiss German Swiss engineer, Swiss German engineer, I should say, that uh, that's very pragmatic. And Brian was looking for a way to grow his little junk business at the time, and he was complaining he couldn't figure it out. And uh, our other friend said, "Well, you know, why don't you just paint a picture of what it looks like when it's done?" Like literally, that's where it started. And uh, so then, as it happens. Brian and Cameron and I worked together to help Brian do his painted picture. He went out on his own uh, to his parents' cabin and, and wrote one up after we, we talked. And that became the beginning for him of executing on the painted picture and got junk as an example. Um, what I discovered was I was very good at teaching it and kind of drawing it out of people. And so um, I literally began having conversations with people, asking questions, um, spending time. And then they would come back to me and say, Dan, you know, that, that conversation we had changed our lives. Like the, the number of times that I've had people tell me that is, um, excuse me, is, is, is just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I enjoy it. Um, I love giving the gift of people's own knowledge that they don't know back to them. You know, I'm thinking about our first conversation, real one, right? Yeah. And um, and it's just, it's so powerful. And, I, you know, one day someone said to me, you know, Dan, what's your superpower? In the beginning, I said, I don't know. And then what I realized is, you know, my superpower is literally inspiring, intentional transformation, okay, which is allowing people to learn from within what they want, inspire, right, and then intentionally drive themselves towards it by making iterative changes 
daily, weekly, however often that they do. Um, so my forum a few years later said, Dan, you know, you do, you're pretty good at this and you're doing it a lot. You might want to talk or, you know, think about, um, uh, turning it into a, you know, like turning it into a bit of a business. And so that became part of what I do. Um, I've worked literally with hundreds of entrepreneurs and their leadership teams. Um, what, what's really interesting is, you know, the frameworks that I used before the meetings gives us the agenda for the meetings. It doesn't come from me. It comes from the people that I'm working with, mm. period, right? And then what I do is I ask the questions in discovery, create a safe space, um, help people determine what their roadblocks have been, and then map a way through those roadblocks in order to create what they want in the future. Um, and literally, the number of times that I give people permission to give themselves permission is incredible mm. because they, that's, you know, as we go, so goes our personal lives as we go, so go our businesses. And if we're not aware of how we go, um, then we can't make adjustments anywhere else. So it always starts from within. I kind of, you know, people have called me a brain surgeon. Um, I, I just kind of work with people from the neck, with businesses from the neck up, right? It's, it's, it's what's, what's really going on that can create, you know, an exponential change and whatever that needs to be based on what people want. Wow. Yeah. And I can, I can give you the testimonial. It works. It absolutely works. I am curious. Um, you know, I look back on my entrepreneurial journey and it's very much a straight line when I'm looking back, but when I was in it and I'm still in it, hopefully for a much, much longer period of time, it's not a straight uh, line. It's not a straight line. And so <laughs> my question to you is those months or weeks or even years prior to that conversation with Brian and got junk and the pain, of, like that where all that started to formulate and bubble, was this ever on your radar that you'd be doing this type of work and having this kind of impact for teams and individuals? You know, I, I always had these conversations and I, you know, there's a, there is a story when I was 10 years old, um, a friend of my, the, the father of a friend of my dad's, um, went into the hospital and was supposed to be on his last legs. And I'll never forget this. Uh, my dad took me into the hospital with him and I watched my father talk life back into this person, hmm. right? He started asking questions and bringing back memories. And I watched as his whole energy changed in the hospital bed. And, you know, he ended up getting another 10 years because he chose that it wasn't going to be time. So I saw that happen and that had an effect on me. Um, and I also, I guess, had, you know, have a similar gift, um, didn't know it, but, you know, I would have conversations even as, as uh, you know, when I was younger that were similar. Um, where I learned, it's ironic, where I really learned or that it became apparent to me was when I took the um, strategic planning training for, um, for, for boards to do in the very beginning. Mike Cato started this thing. And I was one of the first guys who went down to Vegas and, and did the training. And it was like, oh, wow, I really enjoy doing this. I love facilitating. I love working with the people. I love asking questions and, and kind of solving the puzzles. And so that was the, the time that really pulled me, you know, pulled me out and showed me that, um, that it was a direction that I wanted to go in. So as I was painting the picture for myself, it became part of my painted picture. I want to be able to work with people, help them see their futures, learn what's holding them back and, and make their lives better as well. And so, you know, I just started doing it uh, as part of what I do. I have direct impact from all that experience from your paid picture facilitation. But in the meantime, <laughs> you must've been running businesses and keeping the lights on on the mortgage paid. paid. Mm -hmm. So Talk to us about your the other side of your business life. Yeah. I'd love to hear that story and any previous businesses. We mentioned in your intro the yeah. the family business of the campgrounds. Like, give us a sense of Goodness. sort of the nuts and bolts of, sure. of the, that business side. So, 
you know, I started a manufacturing business back in the late 80s um, when things were manufactured in North America. We were making control panels and other components for electronics. Um, I went through that for, goodness, probably 15 years. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I remember having lunch with Vern one day. And and he said, you know, you ever take a sabbatical? Because I think the longest holiday I'd taken at that time was 10 days. Because, you, you know, it's safe to go away for the last couple of days of a week. And then by the things that go wrong aren't going to be big, too big. It was strange logic. But I know how the number of people that go through that, it's amazing. So I, I booked, you know, six weeks in Europe, six months out. And I did it. I took my family. I went out there. We had a great time. Um, and when I got back, I discovered that I had started a business that was 180 degrees opposed to who I am. Hmm. It was not me. It wasn't aligned with me. Um, and I really sat down and said, okay, I need to paint a picture for myself, okay, around what it is that that, that I'm going to be doing professionally and in life. So um, it became, you know, the, the picture became multiple sources of income. Uh, my brothers and I had just bought the family business from our parents. So we've got the, uh, the RV resort in, in Penticton, which is a great, uh, you know, the, this was, this last summer was our 51st summer, right? We're on our fifth generation of people there. It's, it's just incredible. You know, great grandparents <laughs> all the way to the little babies. Um, so, and, and that's been good. And when we first started, I was the older. And then my second brother, the two of us really had a lot to do with painting a picture and guiding where it went. And now my youngest brother is the president and and that takes care of itself for the most part. Um, I started doing the painted picture work uh, kind of on the side of the desk. And uh, the manufacturing company, I pivoted to a sourcing company as manufacturing changed sort of in the mid 2000s. Um, when it was done, I discovered that, you know, it was actually now an information company because the the quality and timeliness of the information that we got from our customers, we gave and got from our vendors, determined the quality and timeliness of the product. And once I discovered that, it actually became the uh, the inception for what has become Omne, which is, you know, a platform that, that automates supply chain operations um, and... Um, I believe is is about to change the way business is done globally. It's a really powerful story, um, but it it has all of its roots in the painted picture work, in EO and the people that I've met and the, and learned from along the way, um, and in me deciding that I wanted to put myself on a journey that was going to really test my abilities. Um, and, uh, you know, in, including putting myself deeply into the zone of discomfort at different times as I was going through this thing. Um, it's amazing how, it's amazing how scary it is when you create a global vision. Um, and then even just starting to tell people, you know, because it, it feels like it's so big, people are going to think you're crazy. And now that, you know, it's six years later, um, and we're going to market with it, and it just feels friggin' fantastic because um, the people that are seeing what we've built are really understanding uh, what it can do for the future. So it's a blast. That sounds like a blast. Go a little bit deeper with Omne, Dan, um, and talk about the, the solution or the problem it's solving for the co- we We have people listening to this podcast that I am sure are on QuickBooks, and you just had a big announcement with Intuit. Yes, et cetera, et cetera. Like so, make it applicable for it. Like, like who would be somebody who wants to use that connection? And and hopefully, we got a few phone calls for you after oh, this. Call, after this, I, I do appreciate it. I was trying to skirt it because I didn't. Uh, I didn't want to make any assumptions, Greg. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so the, the the pain is is interesting because we have lived it our whole lives in manufacturing and in supply chain. Um, if you think of a brand as the center of an hourglass and everything that's below that center of the hourglass is distribution out to uh, either 3PLs or through wholesale and retail um, and and the marketing, et cetera. 
All of that is highly automated. But what's interesting is everything that manages the supply side is still done with email, spreadsheets, WhatsApp, WeChat, Slack, all kinds of different, like it's, it's, it's incredible. And all of them are done outside of the system. So it requires people to get lists of um, things to do. They do them all outside and then they now have to put the information, the results of their conversations have to be put into spreadsheets that are then saved as CSV files and uploaded to these different pack packages they're using so that they can then get more, more Excel spreadsheets out and learn what to do next. And uh, what we did was we built a platform that allows people to actually execute inside the system. It captures all the communications, all the agreements, the information, and it manages the quality between um, outsourced manufacturing partners as it's designed today. And so what it does is it, um, it allows people to do everything from releasing their drawings uh, to the factories for bidding through design for manufacturability, proofing, prototyping, tooling. Uh, and then it's got this ultimate sort of infinite order management attached to it and order change management. And this is where Intuit comes in. Um, our first integration was with that product, with QuickBooks. And so what happens is most companies, when they get to a certain level of complexity, they, they start looking at something called an ERP or enterprise resource planning product. And what we allow them to do is to continue using their existing GL, so QuickBooks in this case, um, and our product ties in their inventory planning with the accounting and in the, it sits in the middle and allows people to execute all of the different functions they have within their own organizations and between organizations for orders that are, that are pre presented. So it's, it's, it's designed for the main use right now is companies that design their own products, but that have other people make it. And then, um, and then, but they sell and market, but they don't necessarily distribute on their own. Interesting. An introduction just came to mind. So remind me about that later. I will. Uh, thanks. So looking forward, uh, Dan, talk to us about your painted picture. What's the next five years look like for you? What What's what's getting you up every night, every morning and, and motivating uh, your reflections in, in the evenings? Well, Omni is a big part of it now. Um, you know, it, it's it's been interesting because every year has been extremely hard. Um, and yet every, the following year, it, it turns out is harder. I didn't know that that was what was going to happen. <laughs> That's dumb. And so, you know, it's, it's go to market right now. It, and it's really interesting. We've, you know, it was a two years. It, it took us to really learn, um, product market fit for the product, um, as we were building it out. And so, you know, we're continuing to build the, uh, the relationship with QuickBooks and the QuickBooks partners. And, uh, so that's our immediate go to market strategy. Um, but you know, the next, the next few years, as I see it, are going to be deeply entrenched in, in scaling this thing until we have the, uh, the right outcome. Uh, having said that, you know, I'm still, you know, the, you had, you know, I did the workshop with you guys in DC, uh, the painted picture workshop, a couple of, few months ago. Yep. And, you know, I still am doing that a few times a year. Um, I love it. And, you know, it takes me places, which is really cool. Um, so I will continue that. Um, you know, I've got a, I've got a book and an app in the works on the painted picture side. Um, but those are side of the desk projects. The, the number one right now is Omni. Five years from now, there has been a significant exit um, or it's, uh, it's, it's growing well, one or the other. And, um, and I am, you know, continuing to grow and learn. That's never going to stop. I don't think I'm ever, you know, I've, I've always said I'll never retire. I'll always have projects because I don't want my brain to atrophy. Um, so I will continue to work with, you know, younger or newer entrepreneurs, uh, and, um, and people that uh, you know, are having challenges that I'm able to help them with. Fantastic. So what is yeah. the best way uh, to get in touch with you? Uh, well, they can email me at dan at paintedpicture.com. If it has to do with Omne, dan at omne.com. That's O-M-N-A-E.com. I, I should tell you the story. It's actually really interesting of the name. 
Um, are are you okay with that? And take yeah, a minute. Please. So um, had one advisor in the early days when we first um, visioned this thing, we actually had a, a URL massprotos.com, which because we were thinking mass production prototype prototypes, it's a good little fit and kind of a sneaky name. And and this person had a name that was very specific to a niche. And he said, you know what? I'm trying to expand my product now. And the name is very confusing. He said, the best thing you can do is find a name that doesn't mean anything to anybody. Um, and in order that you can choose where you go in the future. So it took us a couple of days. We were looking at Latin words and, and different things. Um, and uh, one of the things the advisor had said was, if you built this thing, you'll be everything to everyone. And so I Googled that in Latin and it was omnius omnium. And so I put the AE on the end of the OMN and we looked it up and it was like, you know, $10 for the URL. Um, and, and it's a, you know, five letters, three vowels, two syllables, beautiful, simple little name. And this all goes from the, I don't, do you remember the Chevy Nova case study mm -hmm. when they sold in Mexico, right? You right. can't sell a car that says won't go in Spanish in, in Mexico. And so the real the, the real purpose was to find a name that we could create definition to throughout the globe. And that's that's I believe what ended up happening, although I do know the pronunciation, but you know what? People can think whatever they think. They just the main thing is to know that we exist. <laughs> well, that's when you know your branding has worked, is when it becomes a common term. Correct. And you don't have to correct people like me who uh, want to want to add another vowel at the end. <laughs> Well, Dan, no. it's been awesome having you on the show and it's great to connect as always. Um, all of that information will be in our show notes. So for those of you who are listening and want to reach out to Dan and learn more about his painted picture, I'm not even going to say the name because I want to say it incorrectly. Um, you know, please reach out, reach out to the podcast. Say it. Reach you out can to Dan. say it. Repeat after Omne. me. <laughs> Omne. There we go. <laughs> um, anyway, for again. Yeah. Thanks very much, Greg. I really appreciate you inviting me here. It's It's been it's been incredible. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Dan. And that's a wrap, my friends. Thank you for spending your time with me. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at impactfulleadershipshow.com. One last food for thought. Walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone. <laughs>